Welcome to Tales of History and Imagination. Eccentric Tales from History by Simone Whitlow. Morning. Today we talk of a monster doing monstrous things in the midst of a crumbling empire. I also say words in two languages I do not understand and I am very likely to murder both of those. Today's tale begins in the Mongolian city of Urga, 1st of February 1921. The city, home to Mongolia's spiritual leader, the Bogd Khan, around 60,000 locals, traders, diplomats, and a private army of Chinese invaders from a little over a year before, have been on tenterhooks for months. I really need to step back a little and explain as Chinese first, don't I? Mongolia was in a precarious way, to say the least. For well over a century, the former home of Chinggis Khan was a vassal state to one or other of her more powerful neighbours, Russia and China. The failure of China in 1911, Emperor Puyi deposed, the government giving way to several quarrelling warlords, and Russia in 1917, the Romanovs deposed by a democratic regime in vitro, but soon thrown into a civil war on Comrade Lenin's return left Mongolia free to hew their own path. They did so for a while, till it became clear no one in power knew how to run an economy. Mongolia turned to China for help. Now this put them under China's orbit again, but it doesn't quite explain their current situation. Two Chinese warlords, Zhu Zhizeng and Duan Kuiri, were two of many to build their own army after their emperor fell. In the First World War, Zhu and Duan were allowed to keep their army, under the auspices of helping Britain and France. When someone needed someone to risk their lives and dig a trench near enemy lines, Zhu and Duan's army obliged. This was their main role in the war. With the war over, their real plan, to seize a chunk of China for themselves, as Yang Zhuolin, the self-appointed king of the northeast had done, became too nakedly obvious. Zhu and Duan were suddenly scrambling for an excuse to keep their militia. Self-rebranded the Bureau of Frontier Defense, they took to monitoring the border with Mongolia. On October 23, 1919, Duan and Zhu rolled across the border, with 10,000 troops in tow. They kidnapped the Bogd Khan and posted armed guards everywhere. Through gunboat diplomacy, they convinced the leadership it was in Mongolia's best interests to put them in charge. Mongolia was now run from Mai Mai Chen, the now heavily fortified Chinese enclave of the Verga. Their new kings, two Chinese warlords who dared to dream big. Zhu and Duan may have remained in power for some time, but for the arrival of another army in October 1920. Baron Roman von Ungern Sternberg was an ousted White Army general who travelled to Urga to avoid a certain death. Like China, Russia had imploded of late. A vicious civil war which took up to 9 million lives was still raging. Tens of thousands of soldiers of late fighting alongside one another now bifurcated into the Communist Reds, the Royalist Whites. As a Russian cavalry officer, Ungern had fought with distinction on the Eastern Front before being jailed for violence against another officer while on leave. Needing dangerous men on the battlefield more than violent offenders in jail cells, Ungern was released and ultimately sent to the border towns of Siberia, to the wild and lawless places. His mission, to collect whatever Cossacks, Buryat, Mongolians, Tatars, Kipchaks, and various other really tough guys he could find on the steppes, and build an army. So he did. When things fell apart, they ultimately became his army. For some time, Ungern ran a fiefdom in the Doria region, on the border of Siberia and Mongolia. He ruled with an iron fist, shaking down passing travellers, punishing wayward locals, and destroying any reds who encroached onto his patch. Roman von Ungern Sternberg was soon famous across the nation for his cruelty, fearlessness, and extreme violence. If one spoke of the bloody white baron, everyone knew who they were talking about. And he was also a well-known zealot, though the nature of his zealotry was complex. For Ungern, the divine right of kings was everything. One does not upseat a monarch without facing the wrath of God, 
is a minor aristocrat whose ancestors were employed as enforcers in Estonia, the Scans. Beneath that sat an unschooled religious underpinning, part Christianity, part Mongolian Buddhism, acquired either from his wanderings in the 19-teens, or via an eccentric uncle who was also a fervent spiritualist. Ungern saw himself as the latest in a long line of ancestors, Crusaders, Teutonic Knights and Baltic Pirates, who did very well for themselves through violence, most often for a monarch. Also of note, he was a vile anti-Semite, whose army flew a swastika flag long before the Nazis even adopted that symbol. In Russia, as the Whites crumbled before the Reds, and it looked like Dario would soon be overrun, Ungern wrote to the Bogut Khan asking permission to enter Mongolia. The captive Khan welcomed him, hoping the Buddhist warlord might rid his nation of their captors. Right, back to February 1921. This wouldn't be Zhu and Duan's first rodeo with Ungern. In October 1920, an exhausted Ungern, newly arrived, led his ragtag bunch in an attack on Mai Mai Chen. The Chinese repelled them, but were horrified of their ferocity. Led by a tall, sinewy, wraith-like figure, horrifically scarred and with shark-like eyes, this group moved swiftly, killing without a moment's thought. Ungern particularly in his blood-red Mongolian silk jacket made for an easy target, but it appeared bullets wouldn't even touch him. After several suicidal charges, they left the defenders shaken, some wondering if they weren't facing off against some supernatural force. Ungern's army set up camp near the Curlin River, living in tents as a 40 below zero winter set in. For months, Zhu and Duan's army looked up to the hills at night. Eerie signal fires lit every single night for one purpose, to remind them what was coming. This gnawed at them till they took their frustrations out on the non-Chinese residents. Zhu's army looted homes, they beat locals. One day they executed 50 Mongolian holy men. The other residents of Urga started looking up to the signal fires hopefully. This new army can't be worse than the current lot, surely. Then one night in February. Ungern had personally reconnoitred Mai Mai Chen a month earlier. Legend has it, killing three guards on his way out with nothing more than a bamboo cane. This time they were well rested, and coming at the city with a clear plan. The hills lit up as if several thousand soldiers were carrying torches towards them. This was a distraction, and a massive overstatement of their numbers. Meanwhile, 500 men crept up to the edge of the city, and waited for the artillery to be moved into position. A panicked group of sentries spotted them, and fired upon them with machine guns. The bullets whizzed by, mostly just above their heads. Ungern's army broke into two flanks. One returned fire, while the other advanced, and vice versa. Soon they breached the Chinese defences and overran the town. In the clamour, the Bogat Khan's personal zoo broke from their enclosure, stampeding wild animals adding to the chaos. The Bogat's prize elephant would be found a hundred miles away, days later. As Ungern's army swept Zhu's army back, a contingent of Tibetan monks, lent Ungern by the Dalai Lama, stormed the Bogat Khan's compound. Within minutes, fighting with swords and bows, these commando monks butchered most of 150 jailers and carried the Bogut Khan to safety. As the sun rose, what was left of Zhu's army took whatever vehicles they could and fled Urga. Some were picked off by the men in the hills. A pocket of resistance, who fled to the Russian quarter, fought against Ungern's saber-wielding army with knives and meat cleavers. They were cut to shreds. Now, the people of Urga were rooting for these newcomers, and hoping for freedom. For many, these celebrations would be short-lived. Ungern's army swept the city, murdering anyone they suspected of working for Zhu. While they were at it, they killed any Russian immigrants, with even tenuous links to the Reds. Anyone suspected of being an enemy of the new regime was put to death. Hangings were commonplace. The town market was turned into a giant bonfire, one poor boy was roasted alive in a baker's oven. Then, true to form, Ungern ordered a pogrom of the Jews of Urga. Only then did he turn his attentions to finding what was left of General Zhu's army and ridding all of Mongolia of their presence. Inexplicably, the people of Urga 
Surrounded by evidence, Ungern was a monster, welcomed him as a saviour figure, a living god of war. On 22nd February 1921, in an ostentatious parade, he reinstated the Bogut Khan as king, though he was now really just a puppet for Ungern himself. Ungern's army reopened workplaces and public facilities. He had the city streets swept clean to Lurga Shon. He instituted law and order in the city, even if punishment was cruel and unusual. Lawbreakers were forced to perch on rooftops for weeks on end, or go out naked and unarmed into the wild, where on at least one occasion the guilty parties were eaten by wolves. He floated a new currency, barons, currency tied to the Mexican peso, the sheep, cows and camels on the notes. Erga, for now at ease, declared Ungern the reincarnation of the fifth Bogod Gigan, putting him on the same pedestal as the Bogod Khan himself. Had he remained a relatively benevolent dictator, this tale may have ended differently. It doesn't. Like all megalomaniacs, Ungern had dreams of ruling the world. In this case, he dreamt of reinstating all the cruel and feckless kings deposed in and prior to the Great War. He planned to do this by rallying tens of thousands of like minds into a grand army, which would sweep Asia, then Russia, then on to the democratic nations of Europe. Behind this network of monarchs, he imagined himself, the all-powerful puppet master. Ungern sent out correspondence to a number of like-minded warlords throughout the region. This period of relative quiet also allowed Ungern to get a little paranoid, and look for trouble where there was none. He established the Bureau of Political Intelligence to purge Mongolia of distance, under the direction of the sexually sadistic Colonel Sapilov. Sapilov's end game, the sexual gratification he got out of torturing people to death, but also to go after the wealth of his victims. He deliberately targeted somewhere between 250 and 300 of Mongolia's wealthiest citizens. His witch hunt led to an exodus of wealthy Mongolians which in turn plunged the nation into an economic depression. In mid-1921, the Red Army sent thousands of troops to Doria for a planned invasion of Mongolia. The Reds had offered the Chinese help when Ungern first showed up in Mongolia, but China were pretty sure they could handle them. At the time, the Red Army had enough on their plate anyway, but the dust was now starting to settle for them, and they could afford to spare the soldiers. At the same time, Ungern was planning an invasion of Daria. He consulted two fortune tellers. One told him he had 130 days left to live. The other, 130 steps. Under the weight of these augurers, but also convinced he was a supernatural force himself, Ungern prepared his army for the invasion. On June 1st, Ungern's army crossed the border and faced off against the 5th Red Army, 35th Division, at the town of Kiarka. Commanded by the Latvian Constantine Newman, the 35th Division were also battle-hardened tough guys. They were also far better equipped than Ungern's army, and outnumbered them 2-1. to one. The two forces skirmished till they met in full force, June 11th, in the forest outside the town. Newman destroyed Ungern's army. Ungern abandoned the artillery and fled to the Mongolian border. The Reds invaded Mongolia June 28th, capturing Urga, leaving Ungern rudderless. The Bogut Khan welcomed the Reds as liberators, something he'd regret, as they too, it turned out, were sadistic monsters. Meanwhile, Ungern marched eastwards with the remains of his army, through mountains and snake-filled swamps. He convinced himself if he got to the city of Verkna Udinsk, the White Army and the Japanese would be waiting there for him. As Ungern came across villages, the increasingly paranoid general ordered the village looted, the people murdered. He couldn't chance them being communist spies. Subsequently, they came across deserted village after deserted village. Word preceded him of people crammed into sheds, then set alight. On 31st July, Ungern's army clashed with the Red Army 7th Special Detachment in one such village. They won this battle, then massacred all the prisoners. When Ungern's army got to Verkna Odinsk, the place was swarming with Red soldiers. On 4th August, he fled back into Mongolia, Reds in pursuit. Only 500 of Ungern's army survived this clash. His army finally decided they'd had enough, 
They wanted to leave for Manchuria in the north of China. Manchu warlords were always on the lookout for battle-hardened mercenaries. Ungern insisted they cross the Gobi Desert for Tibet. He still believed if he could link up with other like minds, he could build a pan-Asiatic army and defeat the Reds. His men caved to his demands, but quietly plotted in the background to murder him. A few days later, while Ungern was leaving the fortune teller's tent, the conspirators opened fire on him. Instinctively, Ungern hit the deck, crawled to safety. Keeping low, he got onto his horse and rode off into the hills. Several conspirators, now terrified he'd return and murder them all, packed up and ran in the other direction, straight into a division of red soldiers. Ungern returned that evening, ordering his army to up sticks and follow him across the Gobi immediately. He screamed at the top of his lungs and wildly waved a pistol around, pointing it at his men. Ungern's army refused to go, so he got back on his horse and left. He returned days later, speaking only to the Mongolians, ordering them to follow him. A Mongolian officer wrestled him to the ground and had their god hogtied. He was left, bound, in an abandoned luggage train. Ungern's army dispersed, most going to work for one or another Chinese warlord. The Red Army found Ungern on 17th of August, still in the train. As Russian newspapers filled with reports the dangerous outlaw had been captured, he was brought in for a show trial in the Russian city of Novosibirsk. After a summation of his war crimes, an unsanctioned invasion of a sovereign nation, several thousand acts of murder, and often the most grotesque of ways, the persecution of minorities, and the execution of prisoners of war. Baron Roman von Ungern Sternberg was executed by firing squad. 15th September 1921.